all set. So um, <clears throat> welcome to today's virtual digital economy seminar. It feels a bit like this is one of the same spaces in a seemingly insane year so far. And uh, so I hope you feel a little bit this way as well. Um, so it's a great pleasure to welcome you all and um, to continue this series with another fantastic speaker today. Our moderator will be Imke Reimers at Northeastern University and she will introduce our exciting guest momentarily. If you have any clarifying questions throughout the talk, please send these to Imke in the chat window. She'll unmute you so you can ask a question in person. If you prefer, of course, you can ask Imke to ask the, the question for you. We'll collect questions for the Q&A after the talk in the same way, so don't hesitate to send questions. As always, this session will be recorded and made available on YouTube. So if you do ask a question yourself, you'll appear in the recording. All right, I'm very happy to hand over to Imke. All right, yeah, thanks, Hannes. And uh, thank you, Joshua, for, for coming here or coming here and giving this, uh, this, this talk. Uh, I'm pretty excited, and I think we're all pretty excited to have Josh Gans here uh, from, you know, Toronto uh, Rotman School. And, uh, you know, again, one of those people, you know, most pretty much everybody knows him. So I'm going to keep this short and just kind of leave it at, you know, uh, I'm excited to hear about the specialness of zero. So floor is yours, Josh. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Imke. And thanks for in inviting me. Um, this is my first visit to Lausanne. It looks remarkably familiar, uh, but uh, I uh, and it's also this is a this is a rare uh, thing for me. I haven't. I don't think I've pre presented something non-COVID related for some time. So uh, this is going back to a paper that I wrote in the before times uh, that was motivated by issues that seemed important then, uh, and probably still are, are now. Um, so let me try and motivate uh, the context. Uh, so you have a whole lot of services uh, in the economy where the price to at least one part of the market is set at zero. Um, obviously a great example of this is sort of broadcast TV and broadcast radio, uh, which for, for, you know, for its core services um, uh, are free to consumers. Um, I know in the UK they have a, a fee for, but it's really related to having a TV set um, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, the, uh, but we also see it now increasingly, obviously, in the digital economy, uh, Google being a notable example. It doesn't cost you anything to search. I think if we were to reflect on that, uh, if Google decided they wanted to start pri pricing search, um, we would probably still use it. <laughs> uh, there might be some, it'd be an interesting competitive effect, but you know, there, it's not something that we look at and say, well, I would definitely never pay for that. Um, uh, and similarly with uh, services like YouTube, uh, you know, I know some people are watching this on YouTube now, you're paying nothing for it. Uh, that is uh, uh, that is a choice a choice that has been made. <laughs> um, it, it may be that you wouldn't be watching if they were paying something, but again, uh, it's a choice. Uh, we see this in in um, all of the social networks: Facebook, Snapchat, TikTok. The list goes on. Uh, price of zero. We see that uh, you know these first few that I mentioned uh, all have the quality that how is this possible? Well, they're selling ads to consumers. So there's another part of the business that's, that, that, that's the market. Uh, but Charles Schwab uh, recently went to zero uh, commissions for trade, for stock trades. This was something traditionally that was priced positively, uh, both in non-digital and digital realms, and now has gone to zero. Again, uh, they're looking for other players to make money. Uh, and even in other things like newspapers, uh, newspapers were uh, traditionally priced, even a very small amount of <laughs> newspapers were, were, were priced. Um, uh, but uh, online, there are examples of ones uh, that have chosen to keep their price at zero, the Guardian being a, a good example of that. Okay, so the puzzle of this is sort of, you know, why? Why is this the solution 
to all of these firms' optimization and equilibrium problems. Because as economists, you know, we're trained to not think that any particular price for sure is sort of stands out. You know, we're above that, you know, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give you real numbers uh, as prices. Uh, so, so we understand why you might want to do that. Uh, but, you know, even that's a, that's a choice. We could have some complex number pricing. I don't know. If, I'm sure someone did a, did a paper on that. I don't know what, what it would mean. Um, <laughs> but, you know, real pricing. Uh, and we'll give you down to a discrete unit of, uh, of uh, things, although, you know, like a cent, uh, if you do have to use actual currency, but not even that we believe in, you know, we can go fractions of cents, can go all the way down to a Satoshi uh, or something like that. Uh, so, you know, but yet all these firms are sitting there pricing at exactly zero. And, and you know, I think we've gone with this without much comment <laughs> previously, uh, and some of the reasons for that, let me go through those and, and then explain why I found them dissatisfying. So one uh, set of things is sort of a behavioral argument. Uh, there's been, there was a study of this about a decade ago uh, where zero is a special price because people really are happy when they get something for free. <laughs> and so they had this study where they gave people chocolates and they could either pay a little bit for, for a little chocolate or they were given for free. And then they teased out how much they were enjoying the chocolate. It turns out they enjoyed the chocolate much more if it was given to them for free. Um, okay, so that's, that's interesting. It sort of says that you can sort of, if you want to encourage people to consume something, uh, moving from a small price to free, there's a, you know, a big jump uh, in the elasticity of demand. Uh, there's something going on there. And so maybe that's why zero is a, a special price. People like free stuff. Um, but, you know, again, for an economist, if we're going to do it with rational agents, and we're saying, you know, uh, rational agents would get a grip on this and would work it all out. And they wouldn't be so focused on the free as it as a, as as a, is the relative price of things. Um, the other thing comes in, of course, is the sort of transactional cost uh, issue. Is that you know once you move from zero to something else, you have to set up a whole apparatus to to collect the uh, money from. Um, you know the great example of that being bathrooms. <laughs> it seems that bathrooms, they are costly to provide. They are often provided for free. Sometimes they've got some barriers on them uh, and things like that. But, you know, they, they are free things. Um, if you go to Iceland, however, you'll discover the bathrooms are not free. <laughs> they have gone through that and they decided to charge for the bathrooms. It's not that it was impossible. Um, so the, the, we come back down to, well, you know, maybe it's just the price that you want to charge, the optimal price is so close to zero that because of the transactions costs uh, and the, of the move away from zero, uh, you don't. Or alternatively, in one direction, if you wanted the price to be negative, and this is going to be important later on, that requires a whole new apparatus that's just too costly if you're just trying to pay people a little bit. But my sort of counterpoint to that is, you know, look at Google. Google is happy to sell ads at very small units, very small units uh, to, to advertisers uh, and billions and billions of them doesn't seem to have a problem with that. Um, you know, how hard would it be to charge users? <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to me that the decision to make it free is necessarily because of transaction costs, because when you have so many billions of transactions that are possible and you can attach micro payments at a fraction of a cent to them you're leaving a lot of money on the table you're leaving a lot of money on the table so you know again that's dissatisfying and um what's more as so i'll come to in a second um you know that uh people have thought of that zero price as a constraint and and you know it could go the other way uh, if i want if it's very valuable for me as Google to have people use the service so that I can sell ads, um, why wouldn't I set the price negative um, and induce people to do more of that? 
So uh, the traditional reasons why we uh, suggest that people, uh, you know, one obvious reason against free is you've got to earn some money somewhere. So maybe you earn it elsewhere. Uh, uh, so we have the notion of freemium where we give a product away for free in the hope of upselling you to a more premium product. That seems that that's a, a logic there. Again, you don't have to have a zero price to do that. We choose to have that. It may be a little bit of that behavioral effect, who knows, but you know, people tend to choose a zero price for that, but you can upsell people without having a zero price because there are just layers of it. Um, they tend to be associated with advertisements as a, as a revenue source elsewhere, which then starts to flip into the, you know, not only is it free, why isn't the price negative? <laughs> why isn't the price negative? Why isn't uh, we, we're getting those sorts of outcomes? And we could, you know, a uh, more general version of advertisements is, of course, a platform effect. Uh, you are trying to encourage use on one side of the market that you are is valuable for another side of the market that you are charging for services. Okay, so so those are traditional. Everybody in this uh, audience knows that. <laughs> but this is the thing that really motivated this paper. This was a statement by Fiona Scott Morton's made in a number of settings here. There's, there's a reference in the paper to, to where I get this quote from. She says, digital platforms are characterized by free services. Free is not a special zone where economics or antitrust do not apply. Rather, a free good is one where the seller has chosen to set a monetary price of zero and may set other non-monetary conditions or duties. It is possible that a digital market has an equilibrium price that is negative. In other words, because the value of target advertising because of the value of target advertising, the consumer's data is so valuable that the platform would pay for it. So what she's saying here is we've seen these zero prices and this is an indication of a, a high monopoly price because the counterfactual in the case of competition, uh, Fiona Scott Morton is arguing is a negative price. Again, this is a very familiar argument to economists. <laughs> we, <laughs> we uh, you know, make this, you know, there's nothing special about a zero price. Indeed, prices can be negative and we see negative prices for things all over the place. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes we call them uh, a positive price, <laughs> a price for a service, but, you know, there's still negative prices. If you, if you open up how Varian's microeconomic analysis, the very first thing he does to you is get you out of this thinking about a price as a positive number. Everything's a price is a, just a number on the real, real line, uh, positive and negative, <laughs> with zero just sitting there in the middle. Um, there's nothing special about it. And you know, that's really, you know, like the whole mathematics of it set up that way. And so this is what this argument's carrying on and that, you know, resonates. So, but I sort of looked at this statement and I sort of thought, yeah, but this applies to the monopolist as well. <laughs> You know, uh, you know, it's, it, why did we get to this zero price? Why did, why did they decide that was optimal? And is there, and why this is important is in order to make a statement about is competition going to result in lower prices? And is that a good thing? We have to understand why the zero price was chosen by the monopolist in the first place. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna give you my attempt at this. Is it 100% satisfying? No. Does it have some good elements? I think so. Uh, I'm happy for other people to improve upon this. Uh, I asked the question, I came up with an answer. I don't know if it's the answer, but even my answer has some interesting implications. And so that's what I want to go through. Just to give you a sense of this on the why exactly zero, um, you know, this is your typical monopoly outcome. You can see here, prior demand, marginal revenue, set marginal revenue, the marginal cost, choose the quantity, you get a positive price. Okay, that's sort of what comes of May. Um, how do we get a negative price? I know, well, for starters, if we're gonna, well, we're gonna get a zero price or a negative price, marginal cost better be lower. So we'll lower marginal cost. And uh, what you end up there uh, with a big negative marginal cost is a negative price, even for a monopolist, okay? So, you know, uh, uh, the good news, by the way, about this presentation, it's all in this graph. 
it's all in these graphs. I'm, 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 I'm pretty much doing nothing. It's almost economic 101, maybe just economic two, economics 201. I mean, it's like this sort of thing. Will this paper ever get published? Who knows? Because how dare you? How dare you use insights from the tools of uh, textbooks? I mean, a, a student could have done this. Um, okay, so um, I digress. <laughs> so, so here's the issue, as you can see when you draw this graph, I, in order to get myself a price of zero, I gotta be careful about my graph drawing and, and I, I've done it here. I've shown how you can do it. Look at that, ta-da. I've moved the marginal cost curve just so I can get exactly a price of zero. Now, what that is not, is a prediction. <laughs> that, is, that is not a very satisfying example for why a price is zero. Oh, it's because in Google, Facebook, exactly the demand and cost conditions are such that they optimize at zero. I mean, we could do the raise hand for, if I should set up a poll. Anyone believe that that's the reason they, anyone who believes, I'm gonna put, go to participate, put up your hand if you believe that the reason they're charging zero is they've carefully balanced demand and cost like this. Okay, I don't think so. Okay, so we don't believe that. Okay. Now, if we did believe that, you could take what's competition going to do. Competition is going to drive price down, and we and the and the price should be uh, negative cost. And in fact, uh, you can actually see that the social optimum price is a negative price as well. So, but that's the logic that uh, Fiona Scott Morden was using. And but this is why I'm unsatisfied. Okay. So if we want to see a monopolist, if we see a monopolist charging zero dollars, how do we know that encouraging competition will increase welfare? We need to understand why the price is zero. Okay. So why is the price zero? I'm going to, you need an anchor. There has to be something important about zero. And again, I'll go to Hal Varian's textbook. There is something important about zero. At the price of zero, uh, you know, at the part of zero is, our demand curves do not just slice through zero. They do not. We have an assumption called free disposal. When your utility gets like it would be uh, negative from doing something, you don't just, oh, well, I got negative utility uh, most of the time, unless you're coerced or you're a parent. You don't do that. Um, so so uh, you, you, you get negative utility and at that point, in all of our textbooks, we have an assumption called free disposal. It says we can't get negative utility because we can always choose to throw the good away and not consume it as intended. Uh, so that gives us already an anchor. And it's a really interesting one from the point of view of industrial organization where we always forget this. We always forget that the price, uh, that the utility of the consumer or willingness to pay of a uh, consumer results in a demand curve that ends up getting truncated and flat at zero, okay? And, and why is that important? Because that condition holds for every single good in the economy. There is no good in the economy where there isn't a group of people who don't want to consume it, <laughs> right? There is no good in the economy. So it holds for all of it. It is, it is a very general property. So I'm looking at that and saying, that's interesting. There's a kink in all our demand curves and we know what kinks can do, they can anchor things. So that's element number one. So just to ground this, so free disposal, imagine you've got a whole lot of consumers of type I, I'm gonna order them by their utility for the good, uh, decreasing in I. Um, so, uh, uh, so I equals uh, zero uh, means a consumer has a high value for the good, I equals one or in this thing, I mean, they have uh, no value for the good. We'll call the ones who have positive uh, utility from consuming the good generic and the ones who have zero uh, non-generic. Um, and and we, we have to think about what that means actually. Uh, and, and it causes you to sort of think about it. Free disposal is a assumption that we freely dispose of, uh, but now I have to think about it. So what does it often mean? It often means that you would, if somebody gave you something you didn't want, um, rather than consume it, you would throw it away, okay? So it, you wouldn't consume it at all. Um, or it might be something that you uh, subscribe to, but don't use, like you subscribe to a gym membership, but don't actually go to the gym. Um, or in the context of digital markets, it's that you load a page, uh, but you don't actually look at its content. 
So for each of these things, if I paid you to have a good here, I want you here, you must, if I pay you, will you take this? You'll say to yourself, sure, because I can always throw it away. I get a payment, it's good. If I say to you, um, I will pay you to be a member of the gym, you say, sure, I can pay me to be a member of the gym. I can always choose not to go to it. If I pay, say, I'll pay you to look at this web page, you can say, sure, get the payment, but not actually do it. But there is a tricky bit here. If we take the advertising model, uh, which is going to be a motivator for our negative costs, at least it's the clearest one. I don't want you to completely dispose of this good. I need you to at least like look at the web page enough to see the advertisements. So I might say, I want to pay you to read the New York Times front page. Well, at the very least, you've got to have glanced at it enough to have looked at the advertisements. So it, there's a tricky bit here, and I'm, so I'm highlighting this uh, because it's a tricky bit. Now, we could argue forever about how relevant it is, how precise it is, and other things like that. For the moment, I'm highlighting this as a, an issue, um, but I will show you how uh, I'm only making my life difficult by it, because if this wasn't an issue, it'd be very easy to get a zero price. <laughs> so I'm just trying to, <laughs> trying to, get, trying to show, show you. Okay, so here is what your sort of demand and supply curves look like when you have this situation of a kink. And here is where my decision to run this entire thing based on a virtual background has been an issue because I'm not actually sharing my screen. So if you look here, the red line is a version of, uh, so utility is just like linear V minus UI, uh, V minus mu I. Uh, the black line goes down as a normal demand curve, hits zero and then goes across. So underneath that uh, blue line, which I would have highlighted had I'd been showing these things uh, rather than my friendly face here, you would have seen. Um, uh, then we can draw here the marginal revenue curve. And that's the interesting one. So the marginal revenue curve goes down, 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 down until it hits that kink. And then it jumps right up because marginal revenue, uh, when the demand is zero and it, consumers are consuming at zero is now zero the whole way through. It doesn't keep on going down or anything like that. The kink, the kink in demand causes a discontinuity in marginal revenue. Okay, and so you see that there in the blue line. Um, and then I've uh, written marginal cost right there, uh, a negative marginal cost. So you can see this is not going to for sure get us to a zero price, but obviously if I uh, lower cost a bit more, I can definitely get to a zero price. But there's some interesting things about that. Okay, let's have a look at this zero price that I have here. The zero price is you pursue, normal way as you think about quantity of a monopolist is we, increase quantity so long as marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost. So in this case, it will take you all the way to cover the entire market. Um, and so there's, you know, like for starters, there's no welfare costs going on here. But, you know, we have to sort of zoom in and look very closely at that price. I'm gonna use myself as a pointer. So if you, uh, uh, What's going on down there? What's going on at this? Oh, this is terribly awkward. Um, what's going on at that point? Okay, at least you got my point, even though it was awkward. What is that? Is that ex is that price zero or is it or not at that kink? Uh, I'm taking this 100% seriously. When I mean zero, I mean exactly zero. But there's a problem if I've got zero utility for something. Do I consume the good if the price is zero or do I only consume the good if the price is slightly less than zero? In other words, you know those annoying indifference conditions that we break one way or the other thinking it won't matter? It matters here because depending which way the indifference condition breaks, I either get consumption at V divided by mu or at one. <laughs> ah. So I got to go to the bag of tricks to see if I can make this work. This is why it goes to Econ 201. 
because you know 101 we might get to this point 201 we've got an issue because i'm not going to get any welfare things if the monopoly is already socially optimal as it would if it covers the market so i've got to say how do i get to a price of zero that is meaningfully interesting uh, because we know at these prices zero not everybody consumes <laughs> um so my suspicion um, is that you, to get to the cover of the market, you have to, if you have a slightly negative price, everybody consumes. If you have a zero price, only a, a, a fraction of the market consumes is what I'm trying to get to. What do I need to do that? Um, just on another part, um, one way to sort of cut away from this, but it only makes my problem a little worse, is to play around with the marginal cost curves. And so, the previous marginal cost, as you can see here, was just flat and below. Um, I could make it also downward sloping um, uh, marginal cost as well, but I wouldn't change this outcome, right? So I want a marginal cost curve that starts off uh, negative uh, and then rises uh, to some degree. And, and this one's kind of like interesting here. You can see the way I've drawn it here. The marginal cost curve cuts this big mass point, which we don't know where things are, are supposed to work out. Um, uh, and the average cost curve uh, uh, can cover the market all at a negative price, which sort of gives me some competitive bite here. This, this idea of looking at it comes from this paper by Mahoney and Weil uh, on selection markets. And what they say is that, you know, price often acts, firms are often uh, not indifferent between what sort of customer they get. And they know that if they, if they um, lower price uh, or if they, if no, if they raise price and they get more costly customers, that's adverse selection. If they lower, if they raise price, but they get, uh, or if they lower price and they get more costly customers, that's advantageous selection. So here I've driven it as advantageous selection. And I think that's relevant actually, if you think about what is this explanation gonna be? One of the reasons you stop at zero is because you don't want those nasty customers who value the don't value the good. <laughs> you don't want them. Um, so if you think about it in the advertising space, is if I'm selling a a, a web page that has uh, articles about uh, automobiles on it, um, so I want everybody who's an automobile, and I'm going to sell that to automakers. Well, if, if you are a consumer who doesn't want to consume that page, you don't care about automobiles. Well, then if I pay you to consume the page to the advertisers, that's just like diluting the product. I'm going to have to charge lower prices to advertisers because I'm attracting people who, who do not necessarily, uh, uh, not necessarily the customers I really want. So you get sort of a pollution effect. As you lower price, you get the worst quality customers. And since a negative price here is really your earnings elsewhere, it means that as you lower price on the market, you're getting customers who reduce your ability to earn elsewhere. That's what that interpretation looks like. It turns out to be important because it's really going to get you to this, uh, this situation. Okay, so. Uh, Josh? Um, yeah. I've got one, one question from Yossi Spiegel, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah, so he's, he's asking if, you know, if marginal cost is less than zero, why doesn't the firm just produce and dump the product and just live off the marginal cost? Oh, well, that's another way of doing it. So here, here's the reason. That marginal cost is coming from consume, at people actually consuming. That was the issue I talked about earlier. So in order for, if we think about advertising, someone has to actually go and visit the web page and see the ad. Now, do they have to consume the content? No. Um, but they have to actually be there. It's just like when you're giving a lecture and you want to see all the faces in class and you feel there's a whole class, do they actually, actually be paying attention to you? Not necessarily. <laughs> so, you know, it's the same sort of thing. And again, uh, and just to, to, to admit that, that's an issue here and you have to think about that with explanations. But let me just preface this just so you, you know where this might go. Suppose you said, well, these people wouldn't consume the web page. Um, unless you value the thing, you wouldn't do it. Then think about what's going to happen to our marginal cost curve. That marginal cost curve, and I'll move closer to it just so I'm friendly. Um, that marginal cost curve is going to go up. Oh, I can't do this. I 
can't do it. Uh, I don't even know which way is up. It's towards my head. Okay, up. And then it's going to hit that point of zero. And then it's going to jump straight up to zero or positive and go across. Cross. Okay. Now, in that situation, you can already see what the equilibrium outcome is there. If I have marginal revenue uh, and marginal cost that are co-assigning on that uh, thing, zero is going to become an easy price for me right there because I'm not going to want those consumers. Okay, so so that's kind of that's kind of interesting. So, as I said, details matter. I'm working my darndest to get a price of zero here, and I'm going to show you what gets it, and then we can talk about it. But I got to deal with my indifference condition. <laughs> so the way I deal with that, I'm going to add transaction costs. That's the traditional way we uh, do things. In other words, um, somebody has to sort of type in their name on a form. There's a transaction cost to get paid some stuff um, or to pay. It doesn't matter. There's a transaction cost either way. Okay. Sorry, so I think, uh, yeah. Sorry, I think Yossi has a, a follow-up follow question. Up. As well. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah. yeah uh, sorry, but I, I still didn't understand uh, how marginal cost can be negative. If it's negative, the, the firm somehow makes money while producing. Uh, yes. Who pays this money? Where is it coming? Advertisers. From? Just think advertisers. Okay, but then uh, you need to model the advertising and you I, you, the demand you, and advertising. Maybe. I don't think so. <laughs> sorry? To, to get through this exercise, I don't think so. I'm, I'm going to tell you what the, the marginal cost curve sans revenue curve for advertisers look like, negative revenue curve for advertisers look like to get me a price of zero on the other side of the market. So but, you are but, right, you could model the av 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 advertisers, but it's still going to come up with a curve. <laughs> okay, so, so I'm so, just going to tell you those conditions. So this comes only from advertising? No, I, I'm, I'm, that's the easiest one to think about. There could be other things as well. I'm, what would be I'm, being, I'm, being, I'm being general. I'm, it, may be, it may be that you are, uh, have some other people who you can sell products to based on, 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 on what's going on. So you, you, um, uh, you, you, you uh, don't charge anyone for um, reading your web page. Uh, your blog posts, uh, but as a result of that, you can get uh, uh, a book deal or speaking fees or something. You know, there's uh, go through, you go through Roche and Tarol's list of two sided markets, and they're all like this in one way or the other. <laughs> there's all another side of the market where you can cross up sides. I'm just saying, of that particular sort of two sided markets, why do we get one side at exactly zero, which means I ha I, I'm going to do it the familiar way to me and model it with the name of costs rather than revenues, but you can think about that as whatever you want. Okay, thanks. So, uh, as you can see, I've got my work cut out for me even with this. Okay, so we'll add some transaction costs. So just for the moment, ignore the pricing issue and just look at the monopolist problem here. The monopolist, if the transactions costs were approximately zero, the monopolist could choose the blue dot quantity Q equals V over mu, or it could choose to cover the entire market. Okay, so I, I ignore for the moment what price would get you to those outcomes. You can then write down what the monopolist profit is from each of those things. Okay, um, and you can see that it's going to be driven because the price is approximately zero at those zero transaction costs. It's either slightly negative or zero, depending on which way you go. It's all being driven by costs. <laughs> So whether I want to supply more or not depends on whether I'm going to get, you know, depends what, what happens to costs, okay? Um, that's just an important thing to note, okay? So what price will get me to the outcome? Well, there's two ways. If I take the transaction cost um, and let it go to zero, uh, then it's like I've got a default not to purchase. The person who has zero utility but has an infinitesimal transaction cost will have to get paid something uh, to, to purchase. So their default is not to purchase. So in that case, a zero price is resulting as a, uh, uh, in the limit as transaction costs go to zero. The alternative is if people have a default to purchase, that is if they got zero utility, they'll just take it 
if it's free, then I just set the price at zero. So both of these are ones that you could see observed with a price of zero. And so I'm unable to tell you anything about them, but I'm just saying now both of those are possible uh, in this thing. And it really depends on what you think the, the indifference breaking default is. Is it to purchase or not to purchase? As I said, a thing we normally throw away and don't think about, but I have to confront it here because I'm looking at a special price. So in this uh, situation, okay, so you can get a zero price here. Um, the zero price can be either way. Uh, it either can get you to the blue dot or the red dot. If the default is not to purchase, which is the one I want to focus on now, you can have a zero price. People do not consume unless they get some positive inducement for it. And so you end up setting your price at zero precisely because you can either have the, the whole mass point or none of the mass point, this area between the line between the red dot and the blue dot. And you choose to have the blue dot because there's a cost advantage to it. Okay. Um, in this situation where that's the observed outcome, in other words, this is what I'm going to say this is what Google's doing, this is what Facebook's doing, etc. This is what they'll do if they're a monopolist. They get to, to, to choose the points. What would happen if there's competition? If there's competition in this graph, this will happen. The price would become negative. The price would become negative. And the reason it will become negative is competition drives you to the point where demand is crossing, is, uh, where, where a demand is equal to aver average cost. This is what Mahoney and Wiles show. You can imagine various different uh, models that get you the same outcome, but this is where you sort of get a perfectly competitive outcome is demand, supply equals demand, <laughs> right? So, so not supply equals demand equals average cost, contestable market type outcome. So you can see you get a negative price. Ah, so Fiona Scott Morton, correct. Get more competition, get a negative price. But we have to check another thing. Is that socially optimal? And here's the problem. Oops, I'm now in, in, I'm going to move myself to the top. I'm going to uh, actually, Josh, to there's, uh, there's another, another question, question or comment yes. from uh, Luis Cabral. I'm just going to yes. uh, ask him to unmute. Oh, uh, just a very simple question. So we're, you're working with the transaction, transactions cost now. Um, so we already know that if, if you have a transactions cost, you can get P equals zero as a mass point. So my question is, what is that you're going to be adding in here? Is it the fact that you only will need a very small transactions cost or? Yes, or because everything I look at is with the transactions cost going to zero in the minute. So I, I, I want the transaction cost so I can explain what the indifference breaking condition looks like, but I don't want it to do anything else. <laughs> okay. So the transaction cost goes to zero at that point which means the observed price goes to zero. So I'm not, yeah, so I'm not using the transaction cost in that other sense. Um, anyway, so here we get the uh, competitive outcome, lower price. What is, is it socially optimal? Here's the interesting theorem of the paper. It turns out that the difference in average cost between one and V mu uh, weighted by consumption is equal to the difference in monopoly profits. So in other words, if you were a social planner, your preference over whether to supply the mass point or not coincides with the monopolist incentives because it's all cost-based. It doesn't have any demand implications because willingness to pay a zero of everybody in that point. So it's all cost-based, which is all that the monopolist cares about. So it may, it, it turns out that, but under competition, you always supply the mass point. So it turns out that the social planner may actually prefer the smaller outcome, smaller output to the competitive case. Now, it would like that smaller output to, if you like consumer welfare, you'd like a negative price there. But from our normal ways of looking at this in terms of sort of total welfare, um, at least with, with respect to this side of the market, uh, you've got a, a, the monopolist and the social planner have equivalent incentives in that regard. So once you've seen a zero price by the monopolist, uh, in this model, it's optimal. That means that if you see a difference between the, what the monopolist does and what a competitive firm does, 
the competitive firm is suboptimal. Now, this is not, uh, not news. Um, it, the, uh, when you've got advantageous selection, uh, 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 Ryle, uh, Weil, uh, Mahoney and Weil also show that you can have overconsumption in equilibrium. So this is just a version of that. It's a little bit starker, um, but it's just a version of that. In other words, there's a case to be made that compelling uh, uh, Google or Facebook to reduce their price to negative may not be socially desirable. And the reason it's not socially desirable is you get crappy consumers. You get consumers that are more costly for you as a result of that. Um, and that's not good for anyone. Um, and that's really what's going on here. Um, it's, 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 a, it's, it's related to the idea that if we start having a zero pr a negative price for things, we're gonna have a whole lot of people consuming in the wrong way, or you're gonna have spam, or you're gonna have uh, poor outcomes and other things like that. And so that can be socially suboptimal. In other words, if the rationale for setting a zero price rather than a negative price is because I do not wanna pollute my pool of consumers and whoever I'm selling to advertisers, competition is going to actually push that price to negative and may actually lead to worse outcomes. At least that's, that's what this theory is saying. Um, I can generalize this and I did in the paper, I don't wanna go in this much where you've got a sort of a stream of transaction costs. You've got one transaction cost that I let go to zero for my purpose of uh, getting a zero price without tricking the model. And I've got another transaction cost which is more significant. Uh, I think I called it expensive disposal. That's not a very good word in the paper, but uh, uh, it, it's a bigger transaction cost. So you've got sort of bifurcation. Any consumer could have the low transaction cost or they could find it really annoying to fill in the web page or give away their data or something, have a high transaction cost. Well, you can get the, sa you get the same uh, welfare result and other results as a, uh, from that uh, situation. Uh, so it, 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 it has some robustness of some generality uh, here. Um, uh, that's all I want to say. Um, the other thing I also do, which messes up my graph considerably, is uh, imagine that you could invest at a fixed cost in a technology that you could cut off. You know, what's really causing you all the trouble are these consumers that are positive marginal costs that get encouraged by the zero price. What if you had a technology where you could identify those and just not supply them? <laughs> In this case, your marginal cost curve would now at zero shoot directly up uh, and you could just stop at that point. Um, and we know the social optimum will involve that point, um, uh, supply everybody with a, who has a negative marginal cost, but not others. Um, in that situation, uh, what we're interested in is who has the incentive to adopt this great cost management, clear out the riffraff machine. And it turns out the monopolist has a stronger incentive to individual competitive, uh, to competitive firms, even when the, there's, it's a contestable monopoly type situation. Uh, and, and the reason for that is because the monopoly is a bit more aligned with the social planner, again, <laughs> that makes them more willing to bear those costs. Uh, so that's in the paper as well. Um, and so I, I point that too, because I've only got one minute left. So let me give you my conclusions. Um, my conclusions are, so basically the paper, that's some effort, demonstrate conditions that generate a zero price equilibrium. You need both a mass point and to make it interesting, you need advantageous selection. The monopolist incentives to supply the mass point coincide with the social incentives. I didn't see that coming. It's obvious once you see it. Competition can lead to a negative price and that can, because of the previous result, be socially suboptimal. With more heterogeneity, you can get a greater range of outcomes, but they still preserve uh, uh, as important cases what I've just said. Uh, the cost management incentives, if you have some whiz-bang technology to do that, uh, stronger for the monopolist to adopt than for competitive firm. And obviously it goes without saying and Yossi's comments come to this. Um, if you want to do real policy analysis, we better model that cost function better <laughs> uh, uh, with all the caveats that we talked about here. Um, but in some situations that might make it easier to get a zero price uh, rather than harder. And that is it, I've finished on time. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Josh. Uh, this was great. And I, I'm always so happy if I, 
right? Like there's a there's a theory talk, and I actually understand most parts. So that's awesome. That's great. So I appreciate the one-on-one approach. Um, we do have a couple of questions uh, or comments. Uh, first one I could have probably unmuted earlier, but uh, Daniel Dillman has a comment. So, uh, yeah, I think he should be unmuted. No. I'm trying to unmute. Am I? I'm, you are muted. I'm audible. Okay, right. So, so this is a lot of talk over uh, a side comment to the little discussion initiated by Yoshi Spiegel. And, um, I, um, you know, I don't know if the optimal price is zero or, or, uh, for, or less, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. Uh, um, you know, there was this question how do you get the marginal cost below uh, zero? Um, you know, even on the internet where marginal cost of production might be vanishingly small, it's going to be at least zero. Um, and Josh says, you know, no net marginal cost because we're selling advertising and we take the advertising revenue. And then there's a question whether we want to model the demand uh, for, for the uh, uh, there and, and the follow up, whether that matters. And I really just had a side comment that there are other ways to get the net uh, cost obviously uh, uh, down and they've probably occurred to everyone already, right? Like you have some other way to monetize the data. Uh, either you sell it or you sell, uh, you use it as a production, input of production. Sell it to the Trump campaign. Et cetera, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So lots of talking, very, very minor side point. Uh, sorry about all of that. No, that's okay. No, I mean, I think that's the, uh, the issue here. And I think that's why applications matter. You know, the relevant question is, can I get the data? Can I get the data from cons people who, who, who don't want to be consuming this thing uh, by offering a negative price? Um, for instance, can I get them to click likes and other things that reveal their type <laughs> and what have it? And so that's, that's, uh, that's, that's completely unclear, uh, you know, uh, from this. I, I'm just saying that you have to be able to do that. <laughs> you have to be able to do that in order to get this outcome. Um, uh, at least I can't see another way of doing so. I, as I said, I think it'll be interesting. Uh, it's it's easy with these graphs, you know, to try and draw different ones. And I spent a lot of time doing it, and this is where I landed. But I, I know there's some judgment. All right, uh, great. I think uh, you know on a related the the, the zero price thing, or not? Uh, sorry, the negative marginal cost thing seems to have a little bit of a get some get some excitement here right so uh yossi has another uh, question on that as well or so uh speaking of negative yet marginal costs yossi yeah. yes yeah so, so now let me speak about negative price uh if price is negative what prevents uh people uh i don't know where from north korea maybe uh to set bots and uh, generate fake demands and uh, pump money so maybe that's it so maybe that's what I mean, okay? So maybe that's what, I, what, 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 what you mean. Maybe that's the reason we get to zero and not below. So you just draw that into the cost curve. If you draw that into the cost curve, you get everybody who's consuming nicely as a normal negative marginal cost. I'd love to have more of those people and I'd pay for them. However, as I drop the price down to negative, I get some consumers who are reasonable, who buy that thing and some who are not. And the, the lower the price goes, the more the unreasonable people pop in. And so that marginal cost curve is rising right up there. Okay. So that's exactly the sort of case that I think we have in mind. I think actually, if you asked, um, actually, I did. I asked, you know, I sent this to Hal Berry and I said, you know, why have you got a zero price? Here's my explanation. He said, yes, yes, this is, this is what it would look like in a, in a, in a, in a, a diagram because we are worried about bots. That's what they're worried about. They don't go to a negative price, they're worried about bots. And then as people came back to me and said, well, what if you had a way of identifying the bots, which was my cost management idea. All right, um, cool. So, so uh, Hannes also has a, has a question. So I think my question relates very much to this, but I thought it was more an empirical question. So I was wondering about ad, about targeting. So, uh, and I think this is exactly the relation probably. So if targeting was good, um, I mean, the monopolist uh, would not have to worry about serving crappy consumers because they could pick which ads to show to which consumers and they would, you know, make money from that. Right. 
And so the bot example, if targeting was good enough, they would identify bots and this wouldn't be a matter. So, yeah. so the conclusion then targeting is just too bad. So they have to resort to these price. To this That's price. right. That's right. Is that, so my thing is you're not able to, I mean, I imagined if you could do it perfectly, you're right. It all solves all this, right? Um, um, uh, well, you still get you still get to zero under monopoly, but you you if the competitive firms had the same targeting, you'd get to to, to negative prices for them too. Um, so uh, so so you could definitely do that. So yeah, uh, that's a fair comment. Thanks. Um, all right. So then, uh, Luis Cabral also has a couple more questions. Not exactly about negative marginal costs. Well, it is uh, related to that. So I, I'm just, uh, uh, this is kind of interesting. I'm trying to understand how I should be thinking about, about advantageous selection. Uh, is it the case when the buyer's value for the good is uh, positively correlated with the seller's value for the buyer? Yes. And so yes. what kind of uh, evidence do we have for that in, in uh, you know, say Facebook or or or, or, or Google or whatever. I right. think you know, it's an interesting empirical question. I, I don't know that uh, um, I, can, I can see reasons for the correlation to be positive and negative, in fact. So I'd be interested in- Yeah, you know. and it could be positive or negative. And it could be positive and negative. So the reason I think of it positive was like my uh, auto magazine example, is that you know, when I provide a certain sort of content, if, if the consumers who really like it consume it, then that tells me something to advertisers about those consumers. So that's the way I'm thinking of that. Uh, so that was the, that's the uh, example that comes to mind, but you're right, uh, it may not be. So, uh, so this is one of these papers, this is a possibility paper. I, I wanted to work hard to as minimalistly as possible get a, 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 an outcome. And, and take ridiculously seriously, as you can see, I've taken it very seriously what a zero price is um, and, and, and get to it. And, 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 and it's not that you can't get a zero price under a monopoly with that outcome, with the, with the cost curve doing different things. It's gonna be negative and it can go the other way. Uh, it's just, you don't get a welfare interesting one. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, so if you're gonna bring an antitrust case, uh, we need a welfare interesting one. And then we need to understand what comes of that. Um, you know, I don't think, I mean, I think in the end, uh, I think in the end, some of these things are convincing charges against why Google and Facebook don't do, do a negative price. To be sure, if you ask me, if I was gonna take my paper seriously, too seriously for that, what would I be saying? I'd be saying, we want competition for reasons other than getting a negative price. You know, we get better quality, we get better things. Right? And, and that's really what we should be talking about here. In other words, Fiona might be advocating this negative price as a thing to challenge people, but I don't think that's the first order issue in we, why we want competition for all these other platforms. It's qual product quality, which is a whole separate thing. Yeah. All right, uh, we've got, got a couple more points from Ben Kastner, uh, so. Hi, uh, yeah, so uh, in the first, my first point, um, I think you need to distinguish when you're thinking about examples of this between usage prices and membership prices, if we're thinking about platforms as an example. Because right. um, uh, throughout the talk, I was thinking about credit cards where you actually do see negative yeah. prices. That, that is true. <laughs> uh, and so I think one of the ways we can think about preventing North Korean bots from taking advantage of this is if we have positive membership costs, so a credit card fee, but negative usage prices. Right, although the, the credit cards are an interesting case because you have to buy something to get a negative usage price out of that. Um, it's, you get a negative price, you, you, but it's a, it's a fraction of what you've spent. So you've got some skin in the game. So it's a little bit different. Um, which is in itself a cost management situation. I think that's why credit cards get away with that <laughs> because, uh, because the consumers, because there are, it's not free disposal going on. <laughs> you know, it's, it's something, something else. Okay, um, thanks. And then my other point. Uh, so I think this is a really nice illustration of why zero is special. Um, and the reason it being nice here is I'm about to be a little bit critical. Um, 
so you're explicitly not modeling why the marginal cost here is negative. Correct. Uh, and then you're thinking about uh, these welfare results that depend on a fixed marginal cost curve. So again, returning to the example of platforms because that's where my mind lives. Uh, if I'm thinking about advertisers and then I have a negative price for consumers that attracts more advertisers and lets me charge a higher advertising price. And so this marginal cost curve is not independent of the price to consumers. Right. Uh, and so I don't feel like we should put too much weight on these welfare results. That is true. Although I will only ratchet this up to saying welfare results stink in these settings. We struggle with it all the time. I mean, I've written papers on advertising all the time and trying to get welfare results. And in the end, your best argument is to say, well, consumers are better off and advertisers are worse off or vice versa, or you can make both, but like you, you treat them as lumps. Um, but summing as we often do across uh, money metric utilities or, and, and trying to compare it with profits, you know, it, this only highlights that that is a fraud exercise in these sorts of markets. <laughs> that would be my take on it. Like your criticism is a criticism of this paper and all others. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So uh, from what I can tell, these were pretty much all of the comments. Uh, I'm definitely going to be happy to share some of, you know, some of the other comments that I saw in the, in the chat as well. Uh, but thank you so much, Josh, for, for this really interesting talk. And um, Christian wants to kind of uh, say a couple more things at the end. Also from my side, thanks Josh for this interesting talk. I just want to be uh, briefly advertising uh, next uh, week's, actually two week time, uh, the continuation of the white seminar. Um, our next talk will be on October 22nd, same place, same time. We look forward to having Shane Greenstein from Harvard Business School with us. And until then, we're all looking forward to seeing you in, in two weeks. Thanks again, Josh. And bye-bye everyone. Oh, by the way, you should charge him. Uh, for every user that comes in to, to see his paper. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> On that note. <laughs> <laughs>